Welcome to the Four Witnesses of the Messiah, Chapter 4, Session 12A. We're on the home stretch, covering the greatest teaching ever. The Sermon on the Mount is the crown jewel of the apostolic phase of Jesus Christ's ministry, which opened when he boldly declared the advent of the year of acceptation, saying, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. We have witnessed the genius of Jesus on display in this veritable onslaught of truth after truth. He masterfully demonstrated that he towered above all the rest of the sages in his prowess with the word, the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law, and his understanding of the hearts of men. The depth of his artful presentation was breathtaking. The beauty of his skillful use of rhetorical figures of speech was exciting. Truly, no man spoke like that man. I have done my best to convey these things to you so that you could share the experience that those believers had back then who had assembled on that grassy amphitheater in the spring of 27 A.D. They were God's salt of the earth, as you are. They were God's lights of the world, as you are. And Jesus was catalyzing them for them to take his seeds of truth to the world so that it would never be the same. May the same be true today. Jesus just finished his sixth section, which covered the mental techniques necessary to assimilate the basic elements of his counterculture of genuineness. He laid out the practical method on how to develop the same integrity of heart that had been extolled of the best believers of every dispensation before them, of Jacob, of Job, and of David, now in true form of the sages before him. Jesus is about to leave them with his set of Proverbs. But I do need to give this shot over the bow, <laughs> because Jesus certainly did not intend for some of these sayings to be adopted by a new set of hypocrites in order to abuse and control future believers. I don't think he would do that. So, Jesus left them with some memorable summary statements of his teaching. He stated his maxims for life in keeping with the tradition of the great minds of his time. Just as the famed scholars of the Torah uttered their wise statements, proverbs, which were to be memorized and added to the oral law, Jesus was about to give his string of nine pearls in Matthew chapter 7. This also is another instance that we can apply the second generation of hermeneutic principles to certify truths. The first generation of hermeneutic principles of, in the verse, in the context, or the lessons of prior usage, were a good foundation. But there was still something wanting because equally proficient scholars with equal sets of initials after their names could come up with different conclusions. And furthermore, there was usually no settling of those arguments until now. But this is what excites me about this next set of hermeneutic tools which have come to light. Repetitions, signpost words, Structural relationships, Semitic poetry, are all elements of context, which can exert their influence to certify truths. Plus, we've been learning other things like the teaching traits of Jesus, including his use of Semitic hyperbole, as well as how he embedded clues, which he intended to unlock the depth of his teaching, and they were for the diligent student to find and follow. We have come to greatly respect the words of Jesus because 
They are not the words of normal scholars or sages, for no man spoke like him. They were deeply thought through and stated with precision and embellished with beautiful rhetoric and figures of speech. They truly were unlike the words of other men. So, we now can apply these more advanced steps to solve arguments once and for all. Many scholars have said that there are eight Beatitudes. Well, I say there are nine because the word blessed is used of nine things. Throughout this teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, I have shown the alternating sections of beautiful, highly structured Caruso sections with stirring Euangelo sections. And there are a total of eight distinct sections in the Sermon on the Mount. Section number one, Matthew 5, 3 through 12. It's the opening fanfare of the nine Beatitudes. They are the most profound words ever spoken. That section is characterized by the ninefold repetition of the word blessed. Section number two, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. This is the first call out of captivity and out of repression into genuineness. The third section, Matthew 5, 17 through 47. The spirit of the law versus the letter of the law, exposing the abuse and hypocrisy of the legalists and resetting the standards. This was characterized by the six repetitions of You've heard it's been said, but I say to you, the fourth section, Matthew 5.48, just one verse, but powerful. The second call out of captivity into genuineness. Then the fifth section, Matthew 6, 1 through 18, exposing and healing more hypocrisy of the legalists. This is indicated by three repetitions of three phrases. Then the sixth section, Matthew 6, 19 through 34. It's another exhortation on one of the two main themes of the sermon, how to truly be genuine. Then the seventh section is what we're going to cover tonight. Matthew 7, 1 through 23. Jesus Christ's nine Proverbs regarding the kingdom of heaven. And then finally, the eighth section, which we will do in the following session tonight. Matthew 7, 24 through 27, the call to the wise to apply what was taught. So, from this structure, how many Beatitudes do you think there are? Eight or nine? Well, I think it's evident that there are nine Beatitudes in the introduction to match the nine Proverbs in the conclusion. Case closed. These nine Proverbs are like the wisdom of Solomon, but they distill things at an even higher level. They are also in perfect numerical order and laced with structural nuances to form an A, B, C, D, E, D, C, B, A introversion. We can utilize that order and structure to expound their beauties. A decade ago, when I did my first pass through this sermon, I was still in the midst of being educated by God about the power of repetitions and the influences of structure. That, at that time, was something new, and when I brought it up to my peers, some resisted it, or even ignored it, but others embraced it. Reverend Clapp applied it to his study of the book of Ruth, and told me it helped open that book up to him. But now, after I have witnessed the influence of repetitions for another decade in my studies, 
I'm even more sure of their function to protect the writer's original intent for contexts. It is a cross-check. I believe that Jesus was a master of this literary technique. So, we're going to apply observations of structure to draw out more beauties that Jesus intended to be found. There are structures interlaced in the content of the nine Proverbs. These are additional layers, each highlighting and emphasizing the middle proverb regarding God's fathering. The primary trait or pattern is an introversion. A, B, C, D, E in the central term, and then that goes back out, D, C, B, A. The middle one, the E, is the focus. Another feature of introversions is that the opposite terms are coordinated. Either they are in correspondence or they contrast. So the A's, the B's, the C's match. And so by comparing or contrasting them, they can be utilized to explain each other more completely. Now, this was not some obscure analysis that can merely be dismissed or brushed off because scholars are unfamiliar with it today. This was mainstream back then because it was a feature of Hebrew poetry. Hebrew children were schooled with the book of Proverbs. Also, we saw in our Old Testament history class that such poetic structures were a hallmark of prophetic speech. We repeatedly saw that when a prophet took up his parable, they would often lapse into this style of prose. So, one cannot merely dismiss this because we modern folks don't talk this way anymore. Uh, E.W. Bollinger covered parallelisms with alternations and introversions in his book, Figures of Speech Used in the Bible. There are simple ones and complex forms. There also are other reference books available, such as Lectures on the Sacred Poetry of the Hebrews by Robert Loth, L-O-W-T-H, and Sacred Literature, comprising a review of the principles of composition by John Jeb, J-E-B-B. These books are all available for free in PDF form on archive.org. Since Psalms and Proverbs, as well as many books of the prophets, were written in Hebrew poetry, it was well known back then. And Jesus, who had thought through his presentations to the nth degree, definitely did use this. And so, he intended for his students to notice these patterns and follow their lead into his deeper wisdom. Another nuance of their structure is two sets of alternations on either side of the central proverbs that are between things of men and things of God. The first proverb refers to men dealing with men in judgment. The second alternates to regarding men's eye, their spiritual understanding of God. The third alternates back to the things of men, stating that we should not cast our pearls before them. The fourth reaches out to God, asking and seeking and knocking. The fifth proverb stands on its own in the middle. Then, the second set of four also alternate. The sixth is men, dealing with men. And the seventh alternates back to men, seeking God, the eighth is how men can discern other men, and the ninth emphasizes obeying God. So, there are four proverbs on either side of the central one, clearly alternating in content between things directed towards men or towards God. Then, the fifth proverb in the middle is different because it deals with things from God and not 
toward him. So the pattern is X, Y, X, Y, Z, X, Y, X, Y. This also emphasizes the middle term. Then there's even another layer regarding the numerical order. Oh, wow. Can you see that Jesus' audiences were dazzled by his brilliance? Much of that couldn't be recognized at first blush, maybe, because it was so deep. It had to be discerned later when they reviewed it from memory, but it was there. And in this way, I'm introducing our Lord Jesus Christ to you in a whole new way. Because we're getting to know him anew through his words. He truly was the Son of God and the Son of Man. Well, hallelujah, sock to you. So, let's dive in to analyze the treasure. Here is the first proverb, Matthew 7, 1. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged, and with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. This first axiom pierces the heart of Phariseeism. It reverses the effects of their preoccupation on judgment that was promoted by the Pharisees. The number one signifies commencement, being a basis for what follows. So, to judge or not to judge certainly has far-reaching consequences because those are the beginning of two divergent paths. The Pharisees and Sadducees embraced the wrong path and it led to their unauthorized authority over and spiritual abuse of their fellow believers. True disciples of Jesus mustn't judge. That'll be left for the future to be done by the Lord and his agents. Now, we certainly can reprove, correct, restore, and forgive our brethren, but we don't have the right to pass final judgment to condemn or excommunicate them. Our path involves humility, compassion, mercy, and healing. The Pharisee path involves aloof superiority, arrogance, and abuse. So, this idea of commencement is very clear in this first proverb, the significance of number one. I told you that the fact that this was an introversion also can aid in better understanding these words of Jesus. So, let's look at the corresponding A on the other side of the introversion, the ninth proverb, Matthew seven, twenty-one. Matthew seven, twenty-one. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Jesus said, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, the first A, chapter 7, 1 and 2, dealt with judging. Well, does this last A, Matthew seven twenty one through 23, deal with judging too? Yeah, it certainly does. Very vividly, uh, even frighteningly. This passes the sniff test to see if this chiastic structure in the introversion was really intended. The A's do correspond According to E.W. Bullinger, nine is the number of finality or judgment. Bullinger says, quote, Judgment is committed unto Jesus as the Son of Man in John 5.27 and Acts 17.31. It marks the completeness, the end and issue of all things as to man, the judgment of man and all his works, unquote. 
Well, I'm comfortable with letting Jesus be judge. But if we look for insight in the light of the first A, we're going to see the shocking truth regarding how those who were unauthorized to judge have misused this ninth proverb as a club to terrorize believers because they use it to erode folks' faith, don't they? When they ask those questions and cause those doubts, they use it to intimidate believers to follow them, claiming they have the true way to heaven. Well, let me ask you this. Was the first proverb canceled by this one, where Jesus said, don't judge? Do people have any right to judge that use the ninth proverb? Do they have any permission to insert their ilk into the holy words of Jesus? Whoa, Nelly, I think that we should leave this proverb in its context. Jesus had just taught the Sermon on the Mount. Do you think maybe he wanted to use this proverb to emphasize the need to obey what he had just taught? He nailed that down even more in the conclusion. Because he said, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Well, what will was he talking about? What he just taught? Wow. <laughs> the Pharisees were hypocritically saying and not doing. But... You know, those who pass Jesus' final test are those who will do the will of his Father which is in heaven. Well, what is that? Well, to do what Jesus just taught. Context, my dear Watson, context. Would it be logical at all to use this verse regarding stuff that was not in the sermon, like those who misuse it do? Oh, we know the way to heaven better. You got to do it our way. If you don't, this might happen to you. Well, does that fit here in this context? Do they have a right to pass final judgment? In this sermon, Jesus had rhetorically destroyed the hypocrites who judged and abused their brothers. Well, can new hypocrites arise to take their place? Whoa, Dolly. Huh. My advice is that if you hear any ministry misuse this proverb number nine like that, run. Uh, if they're willing to manipulate like that, oh, what else are they willing to do? Okay. All right. I'll get down from my soapbox. The second maxim is directed to counteract hypocrisy. And it even calls it out directly. So, the first two Proverbs in Jesus' nine are no other than the main themes of his sermon. We shouldn't judge one another. Context. Judging was the basis for the Pharisees' spiritual abuse. So, this clearly was reversing religious repression. Then, we ought to avoid hypocrisy and work on correcting our own issues before attempting to correct others. Oh, that's being genuine, which is the essence of Christ's counterculture. Again, context. So, here is the second proverb, Matthew chapter 7, verse 3 through 5. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considers not the beam that is in your own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote that's in your eye, and behold, a beam is in your own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of your own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. The number two signifies a difference. And out of that comes either agreement or opposition. The second proverb involves correcting another's spiritual understanding. they I. This starts in opposition and is supposed to end in agreement if carried out properly. Well, that's a perfect picture of the significance of the number two. 
from discord into harmony. The eighth proverb, the corresponding B, is also regarding truth versus error, good versus evil. So, they fit together in that introversion. Look at Matthew 7, verse 15. This is the corresponding B. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, and neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. The number eight is significant of satiating. This is the corresponding B is the eighth proverb. Uh, it's significant of satiating, abundance, regeneration, resurrection, a new beginning. Well, the eighth proverb involved the difference between real and false prophets, and it was shown by the results of their teaching. A new cycle begins again when one applies what is taught. A seed is planted, and fruit will result. Okay? So, the fruit of the new cycle will show the genuineness of the prophet. The further insight which can be gained by comparing the two B terms is that the false prophets are busybodies who are always telling others what to do while not addressing their own problems. If left undone, that can develop to the point when they have deceived themselves and cannot tell if their doctrine is true or false. It may sound good, but the final proof will be in the fruit, in the results. You see, John the Baptist and Jesus were reformers. They'd come when Judaism in the world needed them the most. It had been a time when many had arisen up and been repressed by the Pharisees and Sadducees or the brutal Romans. And this climate had been so thick and oppressive that it did compel people to arise and try to do something, anything, to counteract it. Whether they declared themselves messiahs or prophets were or claimed as such, the acid test was the same. What was the fruit? Jesus came into this pressure-filled era as the true Messiah and had just spoken to a crowd of seekers and wanderers. John the Baptist had declared that he himself was not the Messiah, but there was one among them who was. Now, John was in prison, and many of his disciples certainly were in that crowd. Jesus had all but declared that he was the Messiah in the sermon, Instead, he had proven by his stellar presentation on the Beatitudes that he was the authority on the kingdom of heaven and then had asked them to stand with him. He had declared that he came to fulfill the law and then he dazzled them with his discourse on the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. Then he taught that God was a father and gave a comprehensive set of the characteristics of genuine fathering Who else could know so much about the greatest father than the greatest son, the son of God? And now, at the end of his discourse, he once again clearly implies to the rapt crowd who he really was with these nine profound proverbs. While the first two proverbs are quite clear to the Western mind, The third one requires some explanation. Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. This is the C. The third proverb. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. The maxim in verse 6. Could be seen 
just as common sense that we should not share our hearts with people who we know will just use it against us or don't give out too much information about yourself because you don't know how it might be used however this may seem a bit odd in the context of the parting shots of this profound sermon because it doesn't seem to flow it's seemingly maybe a, a bit out of character for Jesus to call people dogs or pigs which was the most undesirable and accursed animals to a Semitic person earlier in the sermon he advocated that we should pray for our enemies and forgive those who had sinned against us well you know we can't genuinely pray for someone if we bear animosity and call them dogs or pigs that might not be appropriate Jesus had been imparting much more than mere common sense so I think this proverb must have a deeper meaning maybe if we turn to some of the structural nuances and see if they can help us understand it, we might be able to draw some things out. All the rest of the Proverbs have fit their numerical order significance, so maybe we can expect the same here. Three is significant of completeness, a bringing into reality, something becoming substantial. So, let's ask some questions based on the context. Why would we want to give something holy to dogs? Why would we want to cast our pearls before swine? Dogs and swine are figuratively put for undesirable people. Well, in context, who are they? They must be the hypocrites and the abusers who have despitefully used us or those who have sinned against us. Well, what in this sermon were we encouraged to give them? Context. That's number three significance. To complete, to bring into reality. Well, those things must be what's referenced to as, which is holy, or our pearls. Well, what were they? We ought to pray for them. We ought to bless and not curse them. We ought to forgive them. But why now are we advised to not cast these holy pearls before them? Well, earlier in the sermon, in the section regarding spirit of the law versus letter of the law, Jesus encouraged the abusers to reconcile with their brothers. So they are the ones who are supposed to initiate the reconciliation, not the other way around. The prayers of the abused, their loving and their forgiving, was to be carried out between them and God to neutralize the impact of evil on their own hearts. However, if it was the other way around and the abused were to initiate things and go to the abusers and try to forgive them in person, well, the abusers might not respond properly. They might strike out again. That would be risking further harm, exposing us to evil. Do you see the advice? We are to overcome evil with good. Now, of course, The ideal completion of the process certainly would be for the abused to be reconciled with the abusers. But if the abusers are in tragedy, that would be like giving that which is holy to the dogs or casting our pearls before a swine. The believers would be exposed to toxic situations with the potential for more abuse and injury. So, I think this proverb is advice to protect the victims from further evil. A proverb of Solomon concurs. Look at Proverbs chapter 9, verse 7. He that reproves a scorner gets to him self-shame, and he that rebukes a wicked man gets himself a blot. Well, 
I thought we were supposed to correct people like that. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. So, we need to use wisdom when we do these things. We shouldn't try to force or guilt the abusers into apologizing and reconciling. It probably would be counterfeit anyway. Like 1 Corinthians 14.38 says, If the opposition wants to be ignorant, let them be ignorant. This proverb is the guideline. Something to bear in mind. Sure, there are some circumstances that we can initiate the overtures of reconciliation, such as when the enemy has a need, like Romans 12.20 it recommends, or we have clear guidance to proceed. But forcing victims or abusers to forgive is abuse itself. We don't overcome evil with evil. If either side just tries to exert greater and greater power, that just escalates into more destruction. They must do so of their free will and in their own time. So, Romans chapter 12, verse 18. Romans 12, 18 says, If it be possible, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. As much as lies in you, don't just half-heartedly be serious about it. Live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it's written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hunger, feed him. So, if there's a need, you might be able to do this and make peace. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt warm him with your love. That's the heap of coals of fire. That's the, the biblical phrase. God may guide us to initiate things to plant that kind of a seed. But if we see our overtures being rejected and the abusers won't relent, well, we've done all we can except pray for them. But we still have overcome the evil with good in our own lives. And so we can move forward healed. The seventh proverb also is well known. This is the other C. Matthew seven thirteen, Matthew seven thirteen, Enter ye in at the straight, or the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. But straight or narrow is the gate, and narrow compressed is the way which leads unto life. And few there be that find it. This proverb also has been misused by legalists. Well, look here. Jesus had worked very hard to expose the hypocrisy and undermine the control that the abusers had exercised over believers. Well, he certainly at the end of his discourse was not going to give them a club so they could use that to beat believers with. You must follow our way. If you want to get into heaven, well, do you think he did that? Do you think he gave them that to do that with? I don't think so. This proverb was not intended to mean that. It was difficult to get into the kingdom of heaven. It does say that portal is narrow, precise. Therefore, if one follows the path, there isn't anything preventing them from entry You just have to stay on the path. A scripture prophesying of this time states that fools need not err therein. Look at Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35, verse 8. A highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. But it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. So there's a pathway. It's just precise. There also is one, one more thing we need to acknowledge. And that was that the law was still in effect when Jesus taught this. 
Jesus is speaking this in the gospel administration, in which the goal was the millennial kingdom. Those who abuse this verse want to import their doctrines back upon this verse and say we have to do them. Well, there was new doctrine to come in the changes in the winds of Pentecost, but was it their doctrine? Well, what does the Bible say about this narrow and precise way? No, well, look at Romans 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 8 through 10. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in your mouth and in your heart, that the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from among the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's the precise way. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's the precise way. Romans says that that salvation is, quote-unquote, nigh thee. It's near. It's accessible it's not difficult well does that contradict Jesus he declared that the gate to life was narrow and the path was constricted but that does not necessarily mean difficult it must mean in the it in the sense of being precise it's not in general it's specific there are a lot of distractions in this world dissuading believers from walking for the true God. At this point in time, salvation by grace did not yet exist because Jesus had not yet died for sin. Believers were still under the law. It took discipline and precision to meet the requirements to obtain, quote-unquote, life. Because that term, life, was to attain the resurrection of the just at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. The same lesson applies when we compare the C terms. When dealing with abusive people, one must be careful, wise, and precise, walk with wisdom, then that difficult path can be traversed safely. You see how they correspond? The next proverb is the fourth one, the D terms. Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asks receives, and he that seeks finds, and to him that knocks it shall be opened. This fourth proverb is a special promise. We may need to follow it to get what we came for, to receive healing, because we do have an adversary, and we do live in a world run by an evil landlord. The world does have a spiritual component which we cannot see, unless we're shown glimpses of it by our Father. So, we often stumble through groping but not seeing the spiritual obstacles that are in our way. Well, God has given us the Bible which reveals the pathway of life, and then also sometimes we receive guidance. Other times, God may be trying to get through, but we're distracted because we can't clearly see the spiritual realm. So, the most basic technique is just persist until we reach our goal. Just keep getting back up after we fail. Just keep persisting till we reach our goal and we keep getting back up and we keep trying until we find it or we're guided to the solution just keep moving we'll get there ultimately that in its least common denominator is what believing is that is what abraham demonstrated because he never gave in and he never gave up accordingly the verbs ask, seek, and knock are in the present tense, which implies continuous action. I conveyed this sense by my expression 
that we should keep asking and keep seeking and keep knocking till we knock the door down. Just never, ever give up. If we've erred or been knocked down or made mistakes, just get up. Get back in the fight. Because, you know, this seeking is like when we've lost something. Well, whenever you've lost something and you find it, where'd you find it? Oh, the last place you looked. Ooh, yeah, we know it's there somewhere. It surely exists. I mean, it didn't evaporate. It's got to be around here somewhere. Have you ever searched for stuff like that? Well, what do you do? You just keep seeking till you find it, right? <laughs> So that's what we do with the things that we need from God. The next maxim reverses more effects of spiritual abuse. This is the corresponding D term. It's the sixth proverb. It also is well known. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. This is the famous golden rule of Jesus, the ethic of reciprocity. It's similar to Hillel's statement, which was given a generation earlier. Hillel was one of the famous sages of Judaism. And he said, That which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. That is the whole Torah. The rest is the explanation. Go and learn. This raises an interesting question. Because, do you think Jesus knew the sayings of Hillel? I say yes. In fact, when Jesus strayed behind and was found in the temple at the age of 12, discoursing with the doctors, he could have even been talking with Hillel or his successor. 10 AD was the last year of Hillel's life, and Jesus was born on Rosh Hashanah in 3 B.C., as fixed by the celestial events of the star of Bethlehem. So, by my calculations, Jesus became 12 on Tishri the 1st in 9 AD and was still 12 after Passover in 10 AD. Besides, any practicing Jew who lived in Judea at that time would have heard of Hillel and would definitely be aware of at least his greatest sayings, of which this quote was definitely one. But we also see a vivid juxtaposition of Hillel with Jesus, because Hillel was a Pharisee philosopher. And with their golden rules, Hillel's was stated from the negative, while Jesus was stated the same thing from the positive. Thus, Jesus' golden rule was in keeping with his discourse regarding the spirit of the law versus the letter of law earlier in Matthew 5. A Jewish believer ought to keep the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law goes beyond that. This enhancement was the foundation for Jesus' law of love, which later became the calling card of Christianity. But, it also must be said that various forms of this ethic of reciprocity were known hundreds of years before. About 500 years earlier, Confucius said, quote, Do not do to others what you do not want them to do to you. About the same time, Buddha instructed, quote, Hurt not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful, unquote. It's also found in Hinduism, quote, This is the sum of duty. Do not do to others what would cause pain if done to you, unquote. Some have tried to infer from this that Jesus went and studied these religions during his undocumented years between the age of 12 and 29. I doubt that, since... Jesus was an Aramaic-speaking Jew, and his ministry was directed towards Judea. 
But that doesn't mean he did not know of these famous sayings. Because, remember, Nazareth was like a truck stop on the Via Maris, the Roman interstate highway to the east. Jesus could have heard about them from merchants and travelers. And he was indeed a precocious, inquisitive child, as evidenced from that account of his discourse with the doctors in Jerusalem. And he certainly wouldn't have just behaved that way once in Jerusalem. (laughs) So, Jesus certainly could have learned a lot of things from travelers as they told their stories around the caravan campfires in the caravanserai motels near Nazareth along the Via Maris Road. So, Jesus didn't need to travel. His father brought the learning to him. Therefore, Jesus did not originate the golden rule, but he definitely could have adapted it. What can be learned from the introversion by juxtaposing these D terms is brought out by the phrase, for this is the law and the prophets. It is indicating a distillation down to the basics. Well, similarly, the ask, seek, and knock distills believing down to its basics. Keep at it till you succeed. As one goes through the progression, comparing the A's and then the B's and the C's and the D's also, another pattern is a greater and greater focus, tending from the letter of the law to the spirit. So the A, do not judge, obey the will of God. B, take steps to be correct. C, be precise. D, here are the basics. They're all pointing to the central truth of the central Proverbs. It's like a drum roll leading up to the symbol crash of the central one, the E, the fifth proverb, which is Matthew chapter 7, verse 9. Or what man is there of you whom, if his son asked bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you, then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Remember John the Baptist's father's prophecy? The Jews had been afraid to serve God. That's the common effect of legalism. We should fear God, but we should not be afraid of him. That is, We should have reverence and awe and respect for God, but we shouldn't be terrified of Him. Our God is good always. He's light, and in Him is no darkness. The Pharisees and Sadducees had been featuring God as the judge, but Jesus presented Him as the always good Father. All the things that were coming from the Father would stem from this truth, whether they were the Millennial Kingdom or the advent of Christianity, all those things would be from the Father, and one day soon, God would become a literal Father to them. As I've said before, the Sermon on the Mount was Jesus' lesson plan for the Gospel administration. He later reiterated this truth, adding in one more important thing. Look at Luke 11. 11. Luke 11.11 11. If a son asks bread of any of you, that's a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if you shall ask an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So, among the quote-unquote good things of Matthew 7:11 is the Holy Spirit in Luke 11:13. That was the essence of God's fathering in our sonship. The number five, this is the fifth proverb, is significant of grace. God's fifth proverb involves God giving us His good gifts by His grace and his favor. 
Another feature of this introversion I mentioned is that the closer one gets to the center, the greater the effect of the spirit of the law and the lesser the effect of the letter of the law. The A's extremes deal with judgment imposed by others, either men or the Lord, which is based on their deeds. Well, that's strictly by the letter of the law. Then the B terms move from that to where men react either genuinely or fraudulently, either becoming hypocrites and false prophets or successfully helping their fellow man and having good fruit. The C terms concern themselves with the free will choice that men can take to use self-restraint and take the more precise road. They should act with wisdom towards the hypocrites and false prophets, not casting their pearls before them. Next, there are the D terms in which men practice the greatest initiative, wisdom, and personal responsibility, deciding to persistently live by the spirit of the law and treat their fellow men genuinely. And finally, we get to the center E, where men receive God's gifts. These are inherently spiritual as such with His grace and guidance. They are strictly by the spirit of the law. Both structures stress the middle term regarding our Father's special gifts. Our God is good always. He is light and in Him is no darkness. Every good and every perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. That is fathering Him, being the first cause of the goodness and integrity that we reflect as lights of the world set on the hill, not hidden, and as the salt of the earth. It's the basis for both our healing and genuineness. As we walk in this world as lights for Him doing His will, touching others, spreading the light, and healing others, we shall genuinely overcome evil with good. Our spiritual giftings will be the greatest keys to our victory in influencing our culture. They are like His arrows, designed to impact the world and to better it. We could reach out in many ways, but our ministries that we have been given by the Holy Spirit that He gives us will be the most effective way to affect society. Thus, this structure emphasizes that God is the source of it all. He is our Father, and that truth is the dazzling gem at the center of the sermon, supplying and affecting and illuminating everything. God our Father is the essence and the fountainhead of our genuine counterculture reaching out via our hearts and lives to change the world. Bless you.